We begin with a call to worship. Let your lives witness to Christ's love. Let your thoughts be of peace. Let your actions count for justice. And let our time of worship here and now be a true blessing for all soul and restore joy and praise to our lives. Good morning. And welcome to worship on this fourth Sunday of Lent. I want to welcome all that are worshiping with us today, especially those that are visiting. And please know it's our hope at American Lutheran that you feel at home in our time of worship and fellowship. Today we'll be celebrating the sacrament of Holy Communion and all are welcome to come to the table. No matter where you are in your faith journey, come and share in God's goodness given in bread and wine, the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. Today we'll be serving communion at the altar and we again ask that you listen to the instructions by the ushers and come to the table. Immediately after our time of worship, our Sunday school youth are invited to the fellowship hall for snack and caring conversation, and then it's down to the music room for Sunday school. Uh, there'll be information in the narthex about our ch summer church camps, and we hope that some of you will take advantage of that. And then after the worship service, all are invited to the fellowship hall for coffee and conversation. I want to thank all who helped us out in worship today. I want to thank Gary, thank you for your work on the, on the uh, sound booth. I want to thank Lynn Hardy, our assisting minister. Isaac Johnson, we thank you for being our acolyte. Emily Mueller, we thank you for being our lector this morning. And Amy, we thank you for your gift of music. We ask that you please keep the following in your prayers this week. Deb Pauley, Cody Seehofer, Dorothy Prendergast, Cheryl Pauley, Sharon Chapman, Wade Frosch, Edna Preisinger, Lois Stinson, Belva Stinson, Ron Bowen. We also ask that you uh, pray for uh, Betty Tornis's father and for Carla Wilnitz's father as they are working through some health concerns. This month we're also praying for the mission and ministry at Emmanuel Lutheran Church. We ask that you lift up their church in prayer. Just a few announcements. There's a dine and donate today at Shady Beach and all proceeds go to our ALC preschool. Just let them know you support our preschool. Also, if you save Campbell soup coupon labels, we've just been approved uh, for that for our preschool. And so if you could bring those in, that would be greatly appreciated as well. If your sons or daughters are in third grade, or if you believe that they're ready for confirm uh, to uh, share in communion, please visit with me at some time between now and uh, our first class for First Communion will be at the beginning of May, so please visit with me. Sign up for the Easter 5K, Heidi, it's out in the narthex anytime. And also the Spring Soiree, uh, we are, uh, if you're interested in signing up for that, there'll be somebody in the narthex. Are there any other announcements today? If not, please stand for the confession and forgiveness. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God who brings us safely through the sea, who brings us water from the rock, and who leads us into the land of milk and honey. Amen. Let us come home to God confessing our sins. Merciful Father, we have yes, sinned against heaven and before you. you. We do we not, not fully live as your sons and daughters. We use your gifts to our own ends. Forgive us and restore us, that we may resist all that draws us away from you and be at peace with one another. We are reconciled to God through Christ for his sake. God does not count on our trespasses against us. Once dead in sin, we are now alive to God. Once lost, we are now found. God clothes you in the finest robe of all, the righteousness of Jesus Christ, forgiving you all your sins 
and making you a new creation. Amen. Amen. grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. In peace let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world and for the well-being of the church of God and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to God's people on earth. Lord God, heavenly King, almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take
take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father. Receive our prayer, for you alone are the Holy One. You alone are the Lord. You alone are the Most. Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in the glory of God the Father. Amen. God of compassion, you welcome the wayward and you embrace us all with your mercy. By our baptism, clothe us with garments of your grace and feed us at the table of your love through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. The first reading is from Joshua chapter 5, verses 9 through 12. The Lord said to Joshua, Today I have rolled away from you the disgrace of Egypt, and so that place is called Gilgal to this day. While the Israelites were camped in Gilgal, they kept the Passover in the evening on the 14th day of the month in the plains of Jericho. On the day after the Passover, on that very day, they ate the produce of the land, unleavened cakes, and parched grain. The manna ceased on the day they ate the produce of the land, and the Israelites no longer had manna. They ate the crops of the land of Canaan that year. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. Psalm 32 will be read responsibly with the pulpit side reading the odd number verses and the piano side reading the even number verses. Count yourself, yourself lucky, lucky how happy, how happy you, you must, must be. You, you get, get a fresh start, start your slate swiped clean. When I kept it all inside, my bones turned to powder. My words became day-long groans. Then I let it all out. I said, I'll make a clean breast of my failures to God. Suddenly, the pressure was gone. My guilt dissolved. My sin disappeared. God's my island hideaway, keeps danger far from the shore, throws garlands of hosannas around my neck. Don't be ornery like a horse or mule that needs bit and bridle to stay on track. Celebrate God. The second reading is from uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 16 through 21. From now on, therefore, we regard no one from a human point of view. Even though we once knew Christ from a human point of view, we know him no longer in that way. So if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting the message of reconciliation to us. So we are ambassadors for Christ. Since God is making his appeal through us, we entreat you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. To the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and abounding 
in steadfast love. The Gospel according to Luke, the 15th chapter. Now, because this is a long reading, I invite you to sit down. Now, all the tax collectors and sinners were coming near to listen to Jesus, and the Lutherans and the Catholics and the Baptists and the Pharisees and scribes were grumbling and saying, this fellow welcomes sinners and eats with them. So Jesus told them a parable. There was a man who had two sons. The younger, said, the younger man said to his father, Father, give me a share of the property that belongs to me. So the father divided his property between them. A few days later, the younger son gathered all he had and traveled to a distant country. And there he squandered his property in dissolute, uh, dissolute living. When the younger son had spent everything, a severe famine took place throughout the country and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens in the country who sent him to the fields to feed the pigs. The younger son would have gladly filled himself with the pods that the pigs were eating and no one gave him anything. But when the younger son came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired hands have bread enough and to spare? But here I am dying of hunger. I will get up and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven, and before you I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me like one of your hired hands. So the younger son set off and went to his father. But while the younger son was still far off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion, and he ran and put his arms around him and kissed him. Then the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves, Quickly, bring out a robe, the best one, and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. And get the fatted calf and kill it, and let us eat and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Now his elder son was in the field, and when he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the slaves and asked him what was going on. And the slave replied, Your younger brother has come, and you, your father has killed the fatted calf because he, has, because he has got him back safe and sound. Then the elder son became angry and refused to go in. His father came out and began to plead with him. But the elder son answered his father, Listen, for all these years I have been working like a slave for you, and I have never disobeyed any of your commandments. Yet you have never given me even a young goat so that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours comes back, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fatted calf for him. Then the father said to the elder son, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. But we have had to celebrate and rejoice because this brother of yours was dead and has come to life. He was lost and has been found. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and Jesus Christ our Lord and Savior. Amen. Hey, what's the biggest number you can think of? A trillion, billion, zillion. That's pretty big. How about you? Ten. Okay. How about you? Infinity. Can you top that? Infinity and one. Actually, we are looking for infinity plus infinity. Sorry. What about infinity times infinity? Oh. <laughs> it's not that complicated is the line that follows. This morning, I want you to realize that like AT&T, today's parable from Luke chapter 15 isn't all that complicated. Well, that's what I thought at the beginning of this week. But then I began to work with this parable, and I, the first thing I noticed is that the biblical scholars that wrote on this story, well, they couldn't even settle on a title. The parable of the prodigal son is the title that I grew up with. But this past week, I came across these titles, The Lost Sons, The Welcoming Father, The Lost Son and The Welcoming Father, 
the lost sons and the welcoming father, the lost and the found, and on and on and on. And then I started reading the commentaries that went along with these titles, and I could easily understand why they couldn't even come up with a title that would match for all. For each of the biblical commentators had their own take as to what the major point or points were that Jesus was trying to make in this parable. And yet as I was trying to put my thoughts on paper and condense my ideas so that we could get it done in an hour, I came to the conclusion that the parable was unbelievably complex and problematic. So unlike the uncomplicated understanding of that commercial that we watched, the same cannot be said about this parable today. But then again, when I was a Sunday school student, I remember focusing on the younger son, the prodigal, who was often identified as the one who left his family high and dry and as he took his portion of the family inheritance early and subsequently messed up his life because of the worldly vices that he literally bought into. But then his life was changed as he was overwhelmed by the Father's forgiveness and grace. And the parable served a Sunday school purpose because it became that classic morality tale about repentance and forgiveness. Because the younger son had come to his senses and repent, repented, his past was absolved, and he was able to start anew in the family. It was a great way to uncomplicate this parable. But as I would later discover, it wasn't the only way to understand this parable. It was in my second year at seminary, and one of my professors, Dr. Fredrickson, was holding class just on this parable. And he started out this morality story talking a little bit about the prodigal, but then he moved on to a story about the gracious father. And the professor made the switch from the prodigal son to the father through a few Greek linguistic intricacies that were melded into this parable. For instance, prior to the seminary lecture, I didn't even give a second thought to why this father ran out to his son. But it was the professor that made sure we understood that this is just something that was never done in the Middle East. You see, culture says that the sons or family members comes to the father to show that he is the head of the family. Nor did I notice that the younger son wasn't able to finish his scripted Repentance speech because the father interrupted his speech by giving his own. Because the grace-filled father was so excited about his younger son's homecoming. Well, Professor Fredrickson stressed the importance of reading into the parables. And that will give you a new interpretation of the story. And so I came to see this parable and all the parables as that which we have to read into. Dr. Fredrickson then also went on to say that this parable, from the view of the Father, really gives us a glimpse of God. Well, after hearing the good professor's explanation of the parable, I came away feeling like, this stuff isn't complicated at all. It's easy. But then Wednesday happened. Wednesday is our women's Bible study, and it just so happened that the parable of the prodigal son was what we were studying. And we spent an hour and a half digging through this chapter 15 story. And as we closed the Bible study and prayer, I started thinking to myself, well, there were nine women in our study, and all nine have a different idea of what this parable is about. <laughs> this parable is anything but uncomplicated. It was also during that study that I latched on to a thought that was shared by one of our Bible study members, Charlotte Larson. She said, there aren't just one, there's just not one son, there are two sons in this study. And each of these sons is sharing kind of a worldview. For on the one hand, there is the prodigal who finds himself totally down and out, but when he receives God's gift of grace, he comes to him with surprise and delight. And there and there's the elder son who comes into this story having worked hard all of his life 
and having followed the family rules to the T. And we see that the elder son takes the good news about his wayward brother in a rather resentful way. Because it seems to the elder son that his steadfastness is overlooked and his worthiness is not even considered. And as it was mentioned in that Wednesday Bible study, it seems as if Jesus is telling us that these two responses offered in this story by these two sons are where we often live. You see, one dimension, that of the elder son, reflects our, uh, our life in the world and our need to keep track of things. It's that part of us that has to count. Counting to make sure that everything adds up, that everything measures up. And all this counting is not for our own sake, but it's in service for a larger goal, that being fairness. Fairness. We keep track of things, not because we need to, but because we want to keep things fair and equitable. Isn't that right? Isn't that what we sometimes do as people? I gave this to my son, so I have to give this to my other son. We do that. In the end, we hope all things then will add up. You see, where unfairness is found in the world around us, that inequity has a cost, and somebody or something then has to be changed to make it right. In short, in within us, we have this inner accountant, and that's how we see the world. Fairness. But as important as we think counting is, sometimes we find that it just doesn't work, especially in relationships. I mean, imagine yourself counting every good thing that somebody did for you to decide how much love you should give them. Or imagine keeping track of every hurtful thing that's ever been done to you so you can demand payment for that. It just doesn't work. Not in relationship. And that's why the landowner in Jesus' parable does something landowners just can't do. When his wayward son is seen coming down the road, this landowner sprints out to him. He doesn't send his servants out. He doesn't wait for his son to come to him. Rather, he dashes down the road like no respectable landlord would do and in a way makes a complete fool of himself in the eyes of all the other landowners. And why in the world would he be so eager to have his son who claimed his inheritance early, which is just another way of saying, Dad, I wish you were dead so I could have what is mine. But not only that, the landowner, the father, doesn't even give his son a chance to explain or repent. He interrupts his son and then embraces and restores him. Why does the landowner do this? Because he's a parent before he's a landowner. And so he doesn't continually count all the wrongs of his son, but rather he continually counts all the blessings that his son has meant to him. And if that's not enough, this landowner does something that a landowner should never do yet a second time. He runs out to his elder son. He doesn't call his son inside. He doesn't relay his message to his son by way of a servant. Rather, the landowner goes out to plead with his son to come in and be a part of the celebration. For again, it's not the landowner, but the father who will go out and listen to each of his sons and to each he will show compassion. Today we have a parable that in many ways is extremely complex. And complicated. Because on the one hand, you have a prodigal who feels worthless because of the things he has done and the things he has left undone. And yet the landowner, the father, God, celebrates his being. And on the other hand, there's the elder son, the one that continually counts, the one that you can hear calculating in his words. All these years, you never, that son of yours. Can you hear the counting going on? But that landowner, that father, our God, 
doesn't count. Because he can't and he won't. And that is the piece that uncomplicates this whole parable puzzle. For when we see this parable through the eyes of God, our Father, the creator of all things, the ultimate landowner, the lover of all, whether we, his sons and daughters, have wasted opportunity after opportunity, which many of us have done, or we've been quietly working away faithfully while wondering where and when we'll be noticed, which we've also done, God loves us. Whether we have welcomed others who are down and out or have judged others for not measuring up, God loves us. Whether we think that this parable is good news or it's just another story, God loves us. And whether we are in church today reluctantly or with joy, whether we have a lifelong relationship with God or have just come to know God or don't even believe that there is a God, God loves us. For today's parable, whatever you want to call it, tells us about a gracious, merciful God who blesses us with unending, unmeasurable, uncomplicated love. Amen. is calling, calling for you and for me. See on the portal, he's waiting and watching, watching for you and for me. following people have been elected by the congregation to positions of leadership 
We give thanks for their willingness to serve. In baptism, we are welcomed into the body of Christ and sent to share in the mission of God. We rejoice now that these brothers and sisters will lead us in our common life and in our mutual mission as a congregation. And we ask the following to come forward. Bob Biersbach, Steve Wenzel, Deb Holman, Troy, Troy Castro, Steve Street, Teresa Granquist, Tim Lees, Jason Mitchell, Janet Samlica, Ron Bow, Dale Stengel, and Shirley Olson. A reading from 1 Corinthians. There are a variety of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are a variety of services, but the same Lord. And there are a variety of activities, but it's the same God who activates all of them and everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. You have been elected to the church council and are to assume the positions of leadership and trust in the congregation. You are to see that the words and deeds of this household of faith bear witness to God who gathers us into one together and the whole church. You are to seek to involve all members of this congregation in worship and learning, witness and service and support so that in mission of Christ, this is carried out in the congregation, in the wider church, in the community and the whole world. And you are to be faithful in your specific areas of serving that the spirit who empowers you may be glorified. You are to be examples of faith, active in love, fostering peace, harmony, and mutual understanding in the congregation. On behalf of your sisters and brothers in Christ, I ask you, will you accept and faithfully carry out the duties of the office to which you have been elected? If so, say, I will, and I ask God to help me. I will, and I ask God to help me. If the congregation would stand, and if you would turn and face the congregation. People of God, I ask you, will you support these, your elected leaders, and will share in their mutual ministry that Christ has given to all that are baptized? We will, and we ask God to help us. I now declare that you are installed as council members of this congregation. Almighty God, bless you and direct your days and your deeds in peace that you may faithfully serve Christ. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Go ahead and you can go back to your seats now. Fearing the call to return to the Lord, let us join the whole people of God in prayer for all who cry out in pain and in hope. For polluted oceans and rivers, we seek your healing, creative Lord. Restore the homes of fish and fowl. Teach us to love the earth as you do. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. For conflicts between political parties, we ask for your discernment and wisdom, merciful Lord. Enable citizens and elected officials to listen to one another and to work together for your justice. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. For the unemployed, the working poor, and all who struggle to make ends meet, we pray for your provision, gracious Lord. Break down systems that shame and hold all in the truth that they are your children. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. For all who engage in the disciplines of Lent, we seek your strength and grace, loving Lord. Even as we rest in your mercy, Create a new heart within us. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. For all the saints, sinners of your own redeeming, we praise your name, faithful Lord. Grant that we continue to grow as your people by their teaching and example. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. To you, gracious God, we commend all from whom we pray, trusting in your boundless mercy through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And also with you. Let us pay, share the peace with one another. That's peace. That's peace. That's right, you're not...
hands and voices Who wondrous things has done In whom this world rejoices Who from our mother's arms Has blessed us on our way With countless gifts of love and still is ours today. God, our provider, you have not fed us with bread alone, but by the words of grace and life. Bless us in these your gifts, which we receive from your bounty, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. In the night that he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took the bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples to eat, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is a new covenant of my blood, shed for you and for all people. Do this in remembrance of me. For as often as we eat of this bread and drink from this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. All who thirst, all who hunger, come and be filled with the goodness of God. Please be seated. The body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Now go in peace.
Let us pray. Oh God, we thank you for gathering and feeding us as a mother hen embraces her young. Release us now to go our way in these 40 days, ready to see our work, ready to fast from complacency, and ready to share with those in need. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Please stand. Before, I, uh, before the blessing, I just have to make uh, just a couple of announcements. First of all, uh, Emily Mueller will become our president of our conference uh, today, and she's going over to uh, be elected today. And so congratulations to Emily. And I have to tell you, my wife called me this morning. She wanted me to make sure that everybody knew that it was her sister's birthday today. <laughs> <laughs> Blessing of God Almighty, the wisdom and the power of Christ Jesus, and the light of the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen. of mercy never ceasing call for songs of loudest praise while the hope of endless glory fills my heart with joy and love teach me ever to adore thee may I still thy goodness prove here I raise my Ebenezer, hither by the help I come, and I hope by thy good pleasure safely to arrive at home. Jesus sought me when a stranger wandering forth the fold of God. He to rescue me from danger interposed his precious flood. Christ is with you. Thanks be to God.